Derek Johnson, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So I want to start off by talking essentially in your terms what the NAACP is all about today, because I think for a predominantly British audience, the way we hear about your organisation is so often um, immersed in civil rights history and the history of the 20th century, but we don't hear so much about the work that you continue to do in the modern day. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit about how you view your role today and the main projects you're working on at the moment. Sure. So NAACP, a 111-year-old organization, uh, we are a membership-driven uh, uh, operation. Uh, it's the oldest civil rights organization in the United States. We are in 47 of the 50 states across the country, 2,200 units. A unit is defined as a local branch of adults, a college chapter of students, a youth council of, of individuals, 12th grade and below. Uh, we have a few prison uh, chapters as well. Uh, our role is to uh, improve the quality of life for African-Americans and other disenfranchised communities and to fight against discrimination. So it's a proactive mission and a reactive mission. Uh, much of the work to, uh, that we do today is very similar to the past. Uh, as an advocacy organization, it's our job to impact the formation of public policy so that some of the barriers and systemic problems that African-Americans have faced throughout the history of this nation, we can overcome those, oh, those things. Thank you. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the main projects that you're working on at the moment? Well, one of the biggest projects that we are working on or has been working on is the election to make sure uh, we uh, turn out to vote in African-American communities uh, so that our voices can be heard through our representation at the ballot box. Uh, public policy is driven by elected officials, policymakers, local, state, and national. And so for the target areas we really worked hard on to increase voter participation, we want to make sure those policymakers uh, took into office a value proposition that recognized uh, the value of our lives. How do you do that as a national organization, but obviously working with people on a grassroots level? What does that kind of structure look like for you? The structure is really driven by our members who are in the local communities across the country. And they convene uh, by, the, by state, they convene regionally, they convene nationally, and they really inform the public policy and priorities of the national organization. And so uh, we listen very intently to our members. Uh, we develop strategies and approaches that, that fit the needs and interests that they have identified them. And then we carry out a program so that they can be aligned and synchronized across the country. We're obviously speaking in the aftermath of a summer of seeing a huge amount of civil rights activism, both in the US and the UK. Um, I wonder, based on your experience, how you think we should be reflecting on this and how you think we should be moving forwards? Well, it's an opportunity for us to make some decisions, uh, not only as a nation, but as a globe. Are we going to value the quality of life of all people, or are we going to subject people to levels of exploitation for free and cheap labor, uh, demean their, their ability to exist as human beings, and malign individuals who are different? Uh, these are the decisions where we must make as a global human family. Uh, it is my proposition that uh, we have undermined our ability to really capitalize from the many geniuses that, that, that are among us because we don't allow the individual character of, of so many to really flourish and fully participate from their unique posture. Does this moment feel different to you as a, a kind of a moment in civil rights history, I suppose? Do you think there's been something special about this summer or do you think that it's an awakening that will continue? I think it's very unique, but it's an inflection point. We have to decide, are we gonna move into a future that's more inclusive of many voices and perspectives and experiences? Or are we going to allow ourselves to use this moment as a media headline and then begin to move backwards into a place that, that can be harmful to so many and hopefully not to a place that can cause permanent damage? On then, and I suppose a more individual or a more local level, how do we ensure that this isn't just a moment of media headlines, that change is actually carried forward and taken advantage of? Well, in the United States, it has a lot to do with our civic engagement approaches, the elections, putting in office the right policymakers, 
holding those policymakers accountable so that they can ad adopt public policy that reflect the needs and interests uh, that are important to the very voters who put them in office and making sure we define a quality of life that's amenable to everyone. When capital is strong and democracy is weak, people get exploited. We must strengthen our democracy so we can hold capital in check so we can all uh, pro prosper uh, in a more equitable fashion. I suppose when you look back at the election that's just passed in the states, you see on the one hand these huge essentially voter suppression efforts in so many places, especially in um, predominantly black communities and predominantly in the south. But then on the other hand, you see these huge successes by black activists driving turnout up and having a huge impact on the outcome of the election. When you look back at this election, obviously you see both those positives and negatives, but do you think that Overall, we're going in the right direction. Do you are you more concerned by things like voter suppression or more encouraged by the kind of work that activists have done? Right. So I've seen voter suppression tactics for many, many, many years. Uh, we began to tell our, our members the best way to overcome vote suppression in this moment was to overwhelm the systems with legitimate citizen votes. So that high turnout that we've seen, it was able to overcome. Uh, the, the, the multiple attempts to suppress the vote. Now it is important for us to begin to push for public policy to change our election laws. So elections are not a function of partisan participation. The administration of elections can be more inclusive of our ability to navigate the system and to truly reflect a representative democracy. How do you combat, though, the knowledge among voters that their votes are being suppressed or a sense of, I suppose, disengagement with the system that we've seen in so many places? Well, it's an ongoing fight. It's, it's, it is it's incumbent upon us to keep pushing a narrative of empowerment to allow citizens in this country to see themselves as owners of government, not victims of government. And you assert your ownership through the currency you call the vote. Then if you look back at this election, perhaps, what do you think that the president-elect Joe Biden and his new administration, what do they owe to the African-American voters who got them there? Well, I think uh, it's, it's important for us to have representative uh, of administration that, that truly look like uh, the voters who supported his effort. Uh, we, we must continue to break barriers based on race or gender or orientation these are uh, tools that have divided us in this nation for far too long. These are tools that have uh, divided many people in many nations. And we must overcome that so that those who are in office truly reflect the demographics and the populations of, of people across the country. Um, I wonder what that looks like more in policy terms. What kind of policies will your organization be advocating for and particularly pushing the new administration to adopt? Everything from election administration so we can uh, overcome what many of the vote suppression methods to address the economic anxiety that many people are feeling across the country, uh, making sure we fortify access to health care, something that you all uh, uh, take for granted perhaps in the UK where you have a, a health care system that's more accessible. We're still fighting for that. And we've been fighting for that for over 100 years. Making sure we address the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it is a sad commentary that when the United States, we have so politicized simple things like responding to the pandemic or wearing a mask, uh, removing those political, removing that from a political conversation and make it a part of an essential uh, uh, conversation around our health and our safety so we can get past this moment of the pandemic. I think, the, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. the point you make about healthcare is particularly interesting from a British perspective because, as you mentioned, it's something with which I suppose it's hard for us to relate or it's so unfamiliar. What are the racial barriers to access to healthcare in the US and what needs to change essentially? Well, you know, access to healthcare, unfortunately, is, is really driven by where one lived and that should not be the case. It, all, it is also driven by whether or not uh, you have health insurance. Uh, we need a health care system that account for everyone. It could allow for a more healthy um, population, 
But much of the debate around health care is less about health care, more about tax policy. Mm-hmm. Who gets taxed? Who's not taxed? What the tax dollars are spent for? And just like Social Security, there are the super rich and, and the rich in general who uh, would prefer to pay less in taxes uh, than they would to create a safety net to make our society healthier. I think another thing that you mentioned that's particularly interesting is the impact of the pandemic, particularly from a civil rights perspective, and whether we're addressing the outsized impact that the pandemic has had on the poorest and most disadvantaged communities in the States, especially Black Americans. Um, I wonder whether you think that's being adequately, I suppose, picked up, adequately responded to, and whether you expect the new administration to fully confront those kind of racial differences and the impact the pandemic has had? Well, un- unlike uh, many nations, we lack any federal or national response to the pandemic. Mm. Uh, you cannot address a global pandemic with local or regionalized approaches. Uh, there shouldn't be, but the income administration is in the midst of, of creating approaches as we speak with a task force, uh, as I'm sitting here, he's on the news now with his health task force, uh, building out the strategy. Uh, so when he take off this day one, we begin to uh, see an approach to heal this nation. How much faith do you have that it's gonna be possible to carry out that kind of policy approach? Yeah, we, 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 I remain optimistic. We have to remain optimistic. It is the role of, of what I do. If I was not optimistic, I couldn't do this job. But we see so much discussion at the moment about the American system of government being essentially broken. We see so much discussion about it not being possible to institute so many change for so many institutional reasons. Do you ever feel, I suppose, disillusioned in the sense that we've been discussing? Do you ever get the sense that it is simply impossible to work within the system that exists? I, I always feel encouraged. I've seen progress. I know what progress looked like. But also, I'm a Star Wars fan. I don't know if you're familiar with Star Wars. Uh, even with success, the Empire will strike back. So you have to continue to fight until you ultimately de- defeat the issue uh, that you're advocating for. It is our job as a nation, as an organization, as a community of, of people of goodwill to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And so I cannot give up because if I give up, if we give up, how many people will have the negative consequences of not having someone to speak on their behalf because they lack any voice? I think that's really interesting what you mentioned about the progress that you've seen in your lifetime and in your career. How has your experience of the fight for civil rights in the States over the course of your life and career kind of inspired you today? Is there anything particular that um, encourages you when there is so much discussion of broken systems, etc. Well, first and foremost, the many people who came before me and I sit and listen and learn, mm. uh, and they have so many experiences where we have been able to overcome. And you know, their, their lesson is very clear: don't adopt the narrative of those who are opposing you. Uh, build the narrative of the future you would like to see, and that's how I've always driven much of my work building out the narrative of the future I would like to see. For, er- for everyone who talk about a broken system, uh, there is an opportunity to put things together, to fix, to rebuild, or to replace. And that's what we do as an organization. We, we seek ways to rebuild or replace uh, to ensure there is inclusion from all citizens because it is too valuable of an opportunity in this nation not to progress towards a future that's much more brighter. Um, I want to talk briefly about a couple of your recent projects before we move on to audience questions. Obviously, a recent landmark victory for the NAACP has been in reversing the rolling back of DACA at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more, I think, about how the NAACP got to this victory and what it tells us about how activists can work effectively in this way moving forward? So under the Obama administration, uh, he laid out a strategy for young people who were brought to this country outside of any power that they had, uh, whether their parents brought up here, uh, laid out strategies so they could have a pathway to citizenship. Mm-hmm. And because of that executive order, many young people relied on uh, the DACA executive order and began to accelerate how they will function as fully participating citizens in this nation. 
Under the current administration, he sought to reverse uh, the executive order, putting many of those same people at risk for deportation. And the overwhelming majority of them, 90 plus percent of them, had never been to the country of their birth because they were brought here as, as young people. Uh, and so we challenged uh, that decision in the courts. Uh, our challenge went all the way to the U United States Supreme Court, and we were victorious. Uh, we just learned uh, just recently was victorious again with the administration seeking to undermine it once again. And the court decided that not only could they not undermine it, the person who was in place to seek to undermine it was not lawfully in the position that he was in. Uh, but that decision not only has a, a positive uh, impact on African-Americans, it has a positive impact on the integrity of promises that this country give to individuals and citizens. And the integrity of those promises must be intact because if you begin to undermine the very nature of commitments that the country provide, you completely erode uh, any civility uh, that we have in this nation. Um Obviously, the Supreme working through the Supreme Court is a very important route in American politics, but one that's so often associated with the idea of things being impossible and the partisan divide, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see a positive future for working through the Supreme Court, especially with the recent Republican changes to it? Um, or do you think that it's going to become a more difficult route for civil rights activism in the near future? Well, history have taught us we can never predict how a Supreme Court would be positioned over time. Uh, we would assume a much more conservative, restrictive view of the Constitution, but I don't want to rest on it. I think we should continue to pursue course of action uh, for the interpretation of the Constitution to be more inclusive of all citizens and supportive of our ability to widen the safety net for, all, for everyone. All right, then final point, final question from me before we move properly on to audience questions. Um, the NAACP has this year taken part in the Stop Hate for Profit campaign, seeing boycotts of advertising of Facebook this July. Um, what kind of success did you see from this campaign? And um, do you think that it's a, what do you think about this kind of strategy of sort of vote, voting with your dollars moving forward? But for us, it was important to raise the public knowledge of how powerful this social media platform become. It is operating in many cases as if it was, it was a sovereign nation within sovereign nations uh, with no guardrails of accountability. Uh, the quote community standards they put in place are not uh, operating properly. Uh, there have been far too many convenings uh, and planning and plotting out actions that have caused harm and deaths to people, not only the United States, around the globe. Uh, the platform has been used to undermine democracy and the election process. And we believe as a result of creating this level of spotlight, uh, we lessened the threat for this election cycle. But like uh, this platform has operated before, we really don't know what impact it had on this election cycle. And we won't know until probably some months or a year down the road when the analysis and research is done and we realize that we are still looking at a big threat. Yeah, we've seen quite significant changes in how social media um, companies have their attitudes to elections, particularly in 2020 versus 2016. Um, do you think that this has been effective enough? Do you think they're doing enough? No, I mean, just recently, one of the uh, uh, this administration's former uh, uh, persons uh, made a comment on a platform calling for the beheading of our of our head of infectious disease. And if that is not a violation of a community standard, I don't know what is. So there is so much more to do. Uh, and again, this is not unique to the United States. Uh, we're, we're part of a review board called the Real Facebook Review Board and mm -hmm. headed up by people there in, 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 in Britain. And so we see a problem all around the globe with the use of this platform and how it could be the, the engine to ignite some disastrous outcomes for individuals and communities. All right, thank you. On that relatively somber note, I'm sorry, we'll move to audience <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, the first is from Peter at Mansfield, who says, Obama was talking yesterday to the BBC about how we're now seeing increasingly in the USA what he called truth decay. What do you think about this? And what do you think is the best way to combat it? Well, it goes to the, the conversation about Facebook as a platform. Uh, 
Uh, I love that term truth decay because when you when you walk into the public square uh, for political discourse, there has to be a grounding of facts that everybody can agree on. And if there is no uh, foundation of facts that you can agree on, it's hard to have a conversation. Uh, there is no way for people who differ in their perspective to find the center of gravity of solution if you can't even agree on the facts. And facts are this set, they're facts. The grass is green. Unless you change the color or definition of the term green, it would always be green. But we're finding that people will not even uh, uh, accept certain factual information as facts. All right, thank you. The next question is from Danielle, who says, we've seen a lot of discussion about the importance of representation in recent elections, particularly with reference to Kamala Harris. Do you think that representation is enough? Representation is a starting place. It is not the destination. Public policy to reverse structural racism, public policy to advance equality, public policy to ensure that people are protected, uh, that's, that, that's more of the destination. Representation is only a starting place. So a follow-up question from me then. Do you ever worry that people get so bogged down in, in discussing representation and emphasizing the importance of it that they kind of forget or ignore the important deep structural changes? Or do you think that it's a linear scale where you start with representation and you move on to bigger things? I get concerned with people who see representation as the end game. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we get, you get a lot of that. Just because someone uh, sitting in the seat and they are part of a representative class that have never sat in the seat, uh, that person can be as awful as someone who wasn't a part of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so representation is only a starting point. It can never be the end game. How do you combat that kind of fixation on representation ahead of everything else? I I suppose, especially in recent months among like white Northeastern Democrats. It's, it's, all, it's ongoing education, ongoing communication. It's, it's grounded in, in historical truths. Uh, we happen to have a vice president elect who's, elect who's very skilled, proven record, both as a senator and state attorney general, that she's both capable and competent around issues of diversity and advancing agendas of, of equality. That's really key. But many of us are not, did not, and are not supporting her just because she's a good represent, a representative of our community. We're supporting her because her public policy approaches is consistent with the needs and interests of our community. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Alana at Peters, who says, how is the NAACP working with civil rights organizations around the world? It, it varies. Uh, uh, we understand that some of the conversations that need to be had, some of the things that should be addressed is global in nature. We are an NGO to the United Nations, so we are in ongoing conversations, discussions with groups around the globe. We are in partnership with, with individuals right there in London around uh, Facebook advocacy work. Uh, it, but our, we are rooted in a value proposition of equity. We believe that, that individuals should be treated as human beings with a certain level of dignity and respect and not denied or preyed upon as subhuman. Thank you. A couple more audience questions. The next one is from Nate at Maudlin, who says, what is the NAACP's attitude to defunding the police? But so the, the concept of defunding the police is there is no universal yeah. definition. There is a spirit behind a lot of anxiety from people from different regions of, of, of the United States. So if you go in one part of the country, there is concern with how uh, police unions that really are fraternal orders have abused their power and not represented communities. You go to another part of the country, there's a lot of concern uh, that the resources has been taken from agencies that are necessary, such as mental health support, uh, social worker and other infrastructures to provide proactive support to communities. And those things have been underfunded and an increased fund for police. You go in other communities, there's a concern that the, the law enforcement officers don't live in the communities that, that they are patrolling. Therefore, they have a high disregard. And so it all depends on what part of the country that you live in will, will give, that, that would give you a real operational definition of what that even means.
Thank you. Um, the next question is from Laura, who's an alumni of Keeble College, but who teaches African American studies at Fisk. She says, I wonder if President Johnson could talk about what some goals for educators should be going forwards in teaching topics such as racial inequality and voter suppression. I, you know, I think when anytime you're teaching uh, from that perspective, you have to put uh, in this country, African Americans in the center of the conversations and not victims of history and understand how these things evolve. Uh, uh, and it's really important to right size one's perspective of history. We have never been a community solely dependent on a personality, a central figure, charismatic leader like no, no other community. So there are many factors that come into play. And when you teach it, Sean, uh, students that just like them, many of the actors that you're teaching about were ordinary people who were able to muster the courage to do extraordinary things. And we all have that within us. We're all just ordinary people who can muster the courage to do extraordinary things. Do you think that the American edu or education in America is going in the right direction with regards to teaching the history of racism in the U.S.? I think the education system in this country have been going in the wrong direction in, in regards to teaching. Uh, we are seeking to outsource much of the delivery of our education system to private concerns. Uh, that should never be. Any nation that's looking towards a global economy in our future that's much different than our past, that we should be investing in our education system. We should uh, recruit the strongest and best educators possibly and, and pay them as if they were doctors. Uh, for the long-term survival of this nation, we must invest in, and equip our young people with the school, the tools, skills, and critical thinking ability to navigate a global reality. Thank That's you. not happening. The next question is from Max and Radu from Merton who say, how does the NAACP balance federal, state, and local level activism? Problems like de facto school segregation seem particularly important, yet very difficult to address from the top down. Well, we, we, we address it based on the, the governing authorities that's overseeing it. Because our structure is a bottom-up structure, not top-down, we are driven by our local members across the country in the communities they live in. They establish our policy priorities and focus for the year. And as a national staff, we respond to the staff rooms of those priorities. So it's a bottom-up structure, not a top-down structure. Do you find that, um, depending on, I suppose, as the American kind of media and political landscape often end up being that either ends up being a huge emphasis on national politics or on a very specific area of local politics, like we're seeing in, say, Georgia at the moment, for instance. Does that model ever, I suppose, struggle to move with the times or has it been something that served the organisation well forever? Well, the response to that long question is yes. All <laughs> of what you just said, right? You know, there's always this creative tensions around approach, strategies and focus. And that's a, that's a healthy reality because if you rely on what worked yesterday, two years ago, or 20 years ago, you would miss the mark. So that creative tension on, on what should be the focus, what should be the strategy, how should we approach it and with the tactics. Uh, th 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 that's the healthy tension that we always have to struggle with, learn, relearn, and relearn again. Thank you. Um, the next audience question is, um, how are young activists approaches to civil rights activism changing um, and how should they be changing going forwards? The, the biggest change I say are the tools available. Okay. Uh, yeah, as you have more tools, you have the ability to communicate with people quicker. Uh, anyone with a uh, smartphone uh, become, can easily become an instant reporter of an incident because you have social media platforms. So no longer are we held captive with the, the traditional network news or cable news services. Anyone can be a reporter instantly uh, and that's, that's a powerful tool. Now the responsible thing, we have to figure out how should it be used to make sure people are getting factual information that's actionable and the action that's being taken uh, is more uh, driven by long-term uh, 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 structural changes and not em emotional responses. Um, just time for a couple more audience questions before we wrap up. Um, next one is, 
Uh, excuse me. Actually, no, sorry, I'm going to ask you a follow up on that one. Do you think that social media has been good for civil rights activism in the long run? I think social media uh, is a tool. And as it is a part of our everyday life now, uh, we must continue to evolve as it evolves so that uh, we can use it effectively. I don't think it's good or bad. It's like a hammer and a nail. You cannot say a hammer is good or bad when you got to drive a nail into a board. Uh, it's the tool that's, that you have in your hand at the time. All right, fine, perfect final question to finish on then is from Daniel at UNIV, who says, which civil rights figures most inspire you throughout history? Well, that's a hard one, actually. Uh, I think Bayer Russian, because he was a strategic genius. Mm -hmm. Ella Baker, because she recognized the power of young voices. Uh, a Philip Randolph, because he had the, a long view in terms of organizing working people to be engaged. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and Hollis Watkins, because they struggle with people on the ground. There are so many people. I could just go on and on. Uh, I tend to... I really appreciate individuals who uh, recognize that all of us have the ability to make su substantial change. And they, they, as opposed to try to run in front of the room to be the leader, they get in the room to push others forward. So their leadership's uh, ability can be seen and felt by all. All right, well, we'll stop there. But President Derek Johnson, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's been an honor to have you and truly enlightening. Thank you for the opportunity.